Good afternoon or whatever time um, your uh, time zone you're in. It's good to see you all. Uh, I wish I was in the back of some stuffy lecture hall having bad coffee with you, but that's not the way it's going to be. So um, our first speaker today is uh, Maria Jakerson, who's going to talk about the universality of cohomology theories in algebraic geometry. I'm going to try to monitor the chat. Um, we'll see how that works. Okay, take it away, Maria. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to give a talk in Midwest, although I've never been to Midwest, unfortunately, not yet. So uh, I will talk about, uh, I'll try to give a short summary of uh, several years of our work. Um, this will be joint works with Eldon Almanto, Mark Horova, Adil Khan, and Vladimir Sesnilo. And uh, another work more recent with Mark Horova, Joachim Yebisev, and Dan Bertotaro. So um, let me tell you about the general setup. So, okay. So uh, in general, what we do in uh, motivic, a stable motivic homotopy theory, we, uh, so uh, let me, so stable motivic homotopy theory is the field uh, I'm working in. And uh, what we do is uh, we study generalized um, cohomology theories on schemes, generalized cohomology theories on, um, well, let's say smooth, mainly smooth uh, schemes over some base S, uh, which uh, so satisfy certain uh, properties. So we cannot take care of all of them at once. Uh, so uh, the properties we work with are as following. So, um, an important property which makes it a homotopy theory is uh, homotopy invariance, which in this case is with respect to a fine line A A1. So these theories are invariant with respect to deforming along a fine line. And um, we also want them to satisfy some kind of descent. Um, it's called, so it's descent with respect to Nisnevich topology, which is something uh, between um, the risk and the tal topology, but that's not going to be important today. So just some some useful topology in geometric settings. And uh, the third uh, property, let me formulate it as a tier duality, which is uh, some generalization of Poincaré duality. So like a classical notion of duality, which is also uh, present in the uh, classical modify theory. So examples um, of uh, cohomology theories that we work with are uh, algebraic K theory of smooth schemes, uh, algebraic cobordism, which is an algebra geometric analog of uh, complex cobordism. Um, and um, so another interesting invariants you can study this way are um, Motivic uh, stable homotopy groups of spheres, which also uh, include information about classical stable homotopy groups. So um, um, this, these are already very rich invariants. And also, you can uh, study by these methods uh, more classical invariants. Well, people do it less. But um, let me write that also. So we don't only study some complicated cohomology theories. You can also do, for example, singular cohomology over complex numbers or aladic uh, cohomology. Or maybe you'd like to know about Dram cohomology in characteristic zero. So, OK, and many more examples. So, so our methods allow to study uh, quite uh, diverse cohomology theories. And uh, so today, I'd like to, let me see. So today, uh, I'd like to explain um, a series of structural results on the main examples of these cohomology theories that people usually study by motivic methods. So uh, structural, results on um, 
on some of the examples I listed. So um, let me denote the, them by symbols and then I will explain what these symbols are. So as for now, just some symbols. Uh, so this uh, symbol stands for, so this is uh, the, the unit is the sphere spectrum. So this here live uh, stable homotopy groups. of, well, motivic stable homotopy groups, but you can think about classically of spheres. And uh, MGL stands for algebraic cobordism. And uh, so this is like, if you take it over complex numbers and take realization, you get MU complex cobordism. And so this is like MU sphere. And uh, so the little KGL would realize to little KU so this is the um, connective in Mativic world algebraic key theory uh, spectrum. And uh, HZ stands for Mativic homology, which is a Mativic analog, well, much more complicated uh, of singular homology. So uh, you don't have to know the definition of, of any of those things. I hope I can still speak about them uh, as of like interesting and important invariants of uh, algebraic varieties or schemes more generally, which are well, um, you, worth of studying. So we won't define all of them. Let's just talk about them. <laughs> I hope that's okay. Um, so the main idea, I, I'll, I'll explain the main idea of, of the talk and then I will um, say more precisely uh, what, what, yeah, what the results are. So uh, the main idea is as follows. So, um, although, so all these are cohomology theories. So as any cohomology theories, they are contravariant by construction. So, uh, although uh, cohomology theories mm -hmm. are contravariant, as always, um, the, the, the main idea is that uh, Mativic uh, generalized cohomology theories, so the stuff we study, um, have uh, a posteriori, so not by construction, but it turns out that they have additional covariance structure. And I want to explain how our examples, so these examples here, um, have different universality properties uh, with respect to these kinds of covariance. So this is very vague, and then I'll say more concretely what. I mean, so uh, Mativic general homology theories have a posteriori uh, additional structure of covariance. This is the structure is uh, often called transfers because this these are like wrong wrong way maps. So you, normal map are contravariant and this are, will be covering um, along certain maps of schemes. And uh, so our examples, these main examples uh, turn out to be uh, universal with respect to different covariances. Um, so this is the moral um, of the story. Um, if there are no questions yet, I will get to the more precise formulations. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah, here we are. Um, so let's get to the more precise formulation. Uh, it's weird not to see people with me. Yeah, okay. Well, I hope you're with me. <laughs> um, so, although things can be done over different bases, uh, let's do for today the base uh, scheme, a perfect field. 
So K perfect field. You can think of a field of characteristic zero if you prefer. Or if you're more comfortable, you can think about complex numbers. <laughs> um, so, okay. So when I say motivic generalized cohomology series, what I mean is, um, I mean, well, they are represented uh, by uh, motivic spectra. So um, it's like, usually you would take, you know, spectra by stabilization and here you take, uh, so P1 spectra. So, um, so they live in, okay. So uh, they live in the motivic stable homotopy category denoted SH of K, which is um, defined as follows. So, okay, the construction is slightly complicated, but we, we don't really need to, no, the details here, it's just the place where generalized cohomology theories live and it's constructed as follows. You should take P1 spectra in um, A1 homotopy invariant and Nisnevich sheaves, so those invariant. So this is, when I say these words, I'm imposing those three conditions that I mentioned in the beginning. So A1 homotopy invariants, descent and this, um, so like here, I want how much invariance descent and this Atiyah duality that you mentioned, they, they are secretly here. Uh, so on smooth, so sheaves of, sorry, sheaves of spaces on, on what? On smooth schemes over K. Um, and let me uh, denote this, this construction as star because we will apply it later to different categories than smooth schemes. So what I'm doing is I take some kind of pre-sheaves on smooth schemes, which have these good properties, which make them um, cohomology theories if we want to study. And then we, okay, we want, we have to do the stabilization with respect to P1. But uh, as I said, uh, the main idea, so uh, as since as any sheaves, uh, they, are contra they are contravariant, So how do you get a uh, cohomology out of such a thing? So if you have a spectrum and you have a scheme, um, then, uh, so motivic spectrum and a scheme, then uh, you can define uh, E cohomology space of X. Uh, as follows, so uh, you can, okay, I'll write it first maybe slightly unusual thing, but then I'll say in a second that it's the more usual thing. So uh, for any X, these are just mapping space in SH of X um, from the sphere to E over X. But okay, this is maybe too abstract, but when, when X is a smooth scheme, then these are just uh, maps from the suspension spectrum on X to E. So this is a space, but if you take its homotopy groups, you get cohomology as, as people do in the classical uh, homotopy theory. So uh, all I want to, to argue is that, so by construction, um, this thing is contravariant in X. Okay, uh, so, okay, uh, this is, what we have by default, but we want to so observe um, that there is uh, for any e there is um, some uh, so covariance along some maps of schemes, and I'll give an example now. Some so, so as I, as I already said, certain maps of schemes. So uh, simplest example is as follows. So if I take a fold map, so map from disjoint union of two schemes to itself, which is ID disjoint ID, uh, then uh, what I get is uh, I have a, an, uh, so I want to argue that uh, I have 
covariance. So I want to have a, get a map like this, a floor star. And how do I do this? Well, I use the uh, descent property, which tells me that the value on the disjoint union is the product of values. And then I use that as in any chromology theory, I have addition. So this is addition and it gives me uh, so push forward, so covariant. And more generally, uh, for any finite et al map, um, F, so not just fold maps, but their generalizations, finite et al maps, I will uh, have this kind of push forward on E uh, by a tier duality. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, um, but um, the thing is what I just explained, this holds for any motivic spectrum. So we haven't used yet anything specific and we want to speak today about examples. So um, let's see. So are there, one can ask, okay. So then there are two different questions to ask. One is which covariance do all Motivic generalized cohomology theories have, and which do some of them have? So now are the examples of interest, which were this, uh, this guys. So basically, whatever sphere has, would all of them have? Because sphere is like the, the hardest thing, as some of the organizers now could try to compute the motivic groups of it. So uh, sphere has the worst properties in a sense. So if it has some extra covariance, then all cohomology theories have. But these guys are uh, different examples and they all have their um, well, uh, different properties. So they um, might have different kinds of covariances, uh, more, more than the sphere. So like more transfers than the sphere. And so um, we will argue that that's the case, but let's first see an example. So um, however, uh, some uh, cohomology theories have more, more covariance, well, covariance along more maps or like more transfers along more maps. For example, uh, so for example, um, if you think about child groups, which are parts of, um, so they're parts of the motivic homology, uh, part of, uh, motivic homology, they are covariant along proper maps of schemes. So that's much more. I mean, there are tons of proper maps, which, for example, uh, other cohomology theories won't have transfers with respect to. Or uh, another example would be algebraic K theory, uh, which is, uh, so for small schemes, it's built out of vector bundles and vector bundles they don't have, uh, so you cannot push forward vector bundles along any proper map of scheme, but along uh, proper flat, you can, for example. So, um, covariant along proper flat. Well, there, there is more general, but that suffices for our purposes. Proper flat maps of schemes. Right, because that's what vector bundles, you can push forward them. So these are examples of additional covariance that some cohomology theories have and others don't. Um, okay, are there any questions until now? So far it looks pretty quiet. Okay. Then I'd like to explain now um, what happens for uh, motivic cohomology. Um, in terms of universality with respect to some kind of covariance. And after that, I will hopefully explain what we've been doing. So, um, motivic homology as uh, studied um, by, well, okay, I'll say in a bit that it's studied by them. So, um, I'd like to explain which kind of um, so, th so my talk was, the title was universality of cohomology theories 
in algebraic geometry. So I'd like to explain which kind of uh, covariance um, motivic homology has and which kind of universality there happens. So to do that, I'd need to give a definition of um, Vyvodsky's derived category of motives. So um, it was originally not defined the way that I'm going to say now, but I find it very convenient in terms of comparing with the stable homotopy category that we defined above. So it can be defined as follows um, by doing the same construction. So where was it? By taking this like P1 spectrum in, in, in this kind of sheet of spaces and just choosing, just choosing a different category instead of smooth schemes. So by doing same construction, but on uh, the category core K, which are, so this is the category, Vyvodsky's category of correspondences. Um, so I'd like to think to think about correspondences as of like multi-valued maps. If you stare at the definition for a minute, you so basically this means that usually you occur, like a you, a usual map is like a graph of a function, and here you allow graphs that look like this, so have multi several values. And okay, the the actual definition is that. So objects of this category are smooth K schemes as, as in the categories of smooth schemes. But uh, it has more interesting morphisms than in smooth schemes. So morphism from X to Y are given by the free abelian group on uh, correspondences and correspondences are uh, closed sub schemes in X times Y, which are integral. So integral closed subschemes, which are uh, finite surjective over a component of X. Finite surjective over a component of X. So this is what my graph picture stands for. You have something in the fiber, which may be not one point, but several, so it's like finite. Um, and uh, it's useful for the future to think about this, although that is a subscheme in X times Y, but it's convenient to think of it as of something with a map to X and a map to Y. So like a span. Mm, okay, so I told you what are the objects and uh, maps, but uh, I also have to say that, so composition is defined um, so as usually, you if you have some cycle on x times y and, and on y times z, you pull it back to the triple product, intersect, and then push forward. So it's defined by well taking basically taking pullback. Um, so pullback, intersecting cycles. and pushing forward to, to the first and third scheme. Okay, so uh, this is uh, Vyvodsky's category of motives, but what does it have to do with motivic homology? And um, so this is the uh, important idea that I'd like to emphasize is that, so that's a theorem due to um, round exhaust fire. And then generalized by however, um, Kelly exhaust fire, uh, is that, so this category of Vyvodsky's motives is um, equivalent to the category of modules over motivic homology. Mm, well, this is almost true. You have to invert uh, 
the characteristic in case the characteristic is positive. So E stands for nothing. So one if characteristic is zero and P if characteristic is P. So what does this theorem say? It tells us that um, this guy motivic homology, which is yet another spectrum representing the, so the homology theory, motivic homology, or you can think of it as higher child groups and usual child groups. So this guy is universal with respect to this kind of transfers. Because, so the main idea is that uh, by taking, so when you do this construction, like taking pre shifts on some category of spans, like the correspondences, so uh, by taking pre shifts on a category of spans, or spans are just guys like like this uh, of spans, you enforce um, your uh, pre shifts to have covariance uh, with respect to maps given by left legs of these spans. So this main idea is just a, an abstract nonsense, right? So if you, if you take pre shifts on the category of spans, this means that you can go back. So let me draw it. So you, you can go from, if this is a map from X to Y, then being a pre shift means that you can go back. This means you go back with respect to this map and you go forward with respect to the left leg. So if you take pre shifts on the category of correspondences, you enforce transfers along left legs. And what, what this theorem then says is that enforcing uh, transfers along like this kind of legs, like, well, sort of finite subjective maps over a component, but like there is also this free theorem group, um, is the same as taking modules over HZ. So this means that HZ motivic homology is universal with respect to this kind of transfers. So morally, so morally, this theorem tells us that motivic homology is universal with respect to the structure uh, of uh, transfers along, like they're called just Vyvodsky's transfers actually. So transfers along this kind of, maps, this kind of uh, the structure. So, or maybe I should say with its structure, um, of transfers along Vyvodsky's corresponds, finest corresponds. Mm. So for example, child groups, which are part of motivic homology, as I said above, they are just covariant with respect to proper maps. So in particular, if you have something like finite subjective over component, child groups will definitely have a push forward. So that's no surprise here. Um, are there questions? There's one here from Gabe. I had a question in the, from the chat. Um, but um, so yeah, do, in the span, do those maps have a special property given by Exactly. So we can, so let's, the word span, let's use the word span for any, anything like of this shape, but then we will put different properties on the left leg uh, to encode different covariance. So here in Vyvodsky's example, the property is this finite subjectivity of our component. And later in the talk, I will put different properties. Great, thank you. Yeah, because uh, if you don't put any property, then it's like you are asking too much. You would have covariance along all the maps and like contravariance along all the maps. That's not something that homology theories have <laughs> usually. Um, One other question: uh, I, uh, Is is there any? Uh, does it say anything about K theory? Uh, yeah. I, just, I, was, really? I was just thinking about the the Q construction in K theory, and I don't know, a little a little bit somewhere. So I don't know about Q construction here. I mean, look, I don't know how to relate to Q construction here, but I will say later in the talk about universality property of K theory mm -hmm. of similar type. So, I mean, just, we don't, 
we use another construction to, to think about k-theory, just like the group completion factor balance. But uh, yes, you're predicting right what's going to happen. OK, so uh, unless there are more questions, I would get now to uh, explain what we have done. And how many? Oh, I have 15 minutes. Ah, I'll be done. That's good. Um, so let me then explain in 15 minutes what we've been doing for three years, I think. Um, or four years, I don't know. Um, so as we, as we remember, we had uh, a bunch of like the, our favorite set of examples. And so the theorem of Randix Ostfar and Hauma Kelly uh, tells us about universality of this guy. And then I want to, exp so our results are about the remaining three people in this diagram. So um, let's see. Mm, so the following examples that we've been looking at are um, universal uh, with respect to the following covariances. So I will first formulate and then say a more precise statement again. But um, so we had uh, three more heroes. So we had key theory, we had algebraic abortism, and we had um, a sphere spheres. And so here are the answers that we provide. So uh, for key theory, you take, um, so it's universal with, with its covariance along finite flat maps of schemes. And um, so as, as, as I explained, it's no surprise, I mean, <laughs> it has been known forever that K-theory has uh, pushed covariance along finite flat maps. The surprising part is universality, which I will state more precisely below. And uh, again, so similarly for algebraic abortism, uh, it's all the same. So also finite flat maps with additional property that these maps must be uh, local complete intersections of LCI maps. Um, actually, I should start writing some. OK, I'll write the names in a sec. Um, so and for the sphere, um, we Mm -hmm. So we get in this in this list, like we move backwards in this diagram, and uh, there are more and more res restrictions on the map. So uh, it maps. So this is the same thing. So also uh, finite flat LCI maps, but now with so like such maps, but now we require additional data with extra data of, and now okay something complicated comes, but maybe you can just think about, you know, extra data of some kind of uh, framing. So this framing is the trivialization of um, the relative cotangent complex, which is a generalization of the relative cotangent sheaf. Um, in, so this is this is complex is a perfect, a perfect complex because we took a local complete intersection. And so it gives a point in K-theory. So we want a generalization in the K-theory space of the source of the morphism. Mm, so this is, this is, this extra data is called framing. It's a general, it's an analog of a framing in topology where you think about uh, framed manifolds. Mm, but let's not get into details of this story. Uh, let me write some names, perhaps. So this the story about K-theory is with Mark, Joachim, uh, Dennis, and Bert. And the story about algebraic abortism is with Eldon, Mark, Adil, and Vova. 
And the last story, so the story number three, which is the hardest story. So actually I'm telling it in the, in the opposite direction. So I'm trying to start with a simpler formulation, get to the harder, but of course, so to prove it, we had to start with the hardest. And so this is urgent work, but uh, it's so this, but um, it's based on original ideas of Vyvodsky and then uh, builds on the work of um, a bunch of people and a bunch of papers uh, in St. Petersburg, Ananyevsky, Druzhenin, uh, Garkusha, Yashutov, Kanin. Um, so this is the vague idea. And now to, towards the end of the talk, I'd like to give a precise formulation. Uh, so um, more precisely, how do we make sense of this universality? Um, precise universality. Well, we would like to make it uh, similar to the example of Vyvodsky and Motivic homology, but actually in this case it's it's formulated simpler. So I think you'll see in a second that um, it's it's quite natural. So um, how do we do it precisely? So we say that as as I was asked, so what about like different spans? So we say that, that there are uh, categories of uh, correspondences of like ver uh, or spans uh, where where objects are always uh, smooth case schemes, but we take different morphisms. Um, so from morphism from X to Y is given by a span again, where so Z is some scheme, not necessarily smooth. And uh, we, we put different conditions on the left leg. So, uh, okay, we will need three of them because we had three examples. So, um, so the correspondence, the category of finite flat correspondences where we take uh, F to be finite flat. And the category of uh, finite so-called symptomic correspondences, where we take F to be finite flat LCI. So this flat and local complete intersection is together called symptomic. And then uh, the last guy is the category of framed correspondences, where we take F to be as above, so finite symptomic, so finite LCI, plus this additional trivialization of the quaternion complex in K theory space. Mm, so, okay, when I say category, I'm, I'm cheating a bit because, so they're not one categories because like you, you compose by pullback, which is, you know, defined up to isomorphism. So you should take, think of these guys as two one categories. And then this lower guy, which as I said, was the hardest part of the work, um, is in fact an infinity category because you have this K theory space trivialization, so you have higher homotopy groups. So this guy is an infinity category, which is not entroncated for any n. Mm. And in case some people in the audience are still not sure about their feelings towards infinity category, this work actually gives a very good example where you cannot live without them. Like, um, there were attempts of trying to construct a one category of framed correspondences, but it could not do the work. So um, the results could not be obtained by using just one category. So you really have to uh, take this um, higher, higher maps into account to get the result that I want to state. Okay, and so finally, now that you believe me that there exist these categories of, of different spans, so in the final the statement, so the main claim, is that uh, the canonical maps from uh, materic sphere to algebraic cobordism to K theory to materic homology uh, correspond to 
So um, let me first do nothing. So I just want to take modules. So if I have um, um, like several maps of, of spectra, I can as well take mod, like this induces map on the module categories. So I would have here modules over the sphere is just nothing. It's, I mean, the, the whole, I mean, <laughs> no extra structure. So just the stable homotopy category, then modules over MGL, then modules over K theory, and then modules over material homology. Okay, so here I have not done anything intellectual just yet. So I just said that, okay, natural maps give this uh, induced maps on module categories. And now comes the, the crucial part. So the main point is that are these four isomorphisms that I'm proudly writing up. So that's the main summary. Uh, and so what happens is that um, this, um, these cohomology theories are universal with respect to the transfers uh, we discussed, which means that this is uh, equivalent to the, this uh, category of taking P1 spectrum, blah, 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 on the category of framed correspondences. So we, this is by not doing anything, it's equivalent to enforcing frame transfers. And this is equivalent to enforcing um, finite flat LCI transfers. And this is equivalent to enforcing uh, finite flat transfers. And so the last one is, okay, this was not by us. Uh, so this was already before. So this was uh, DM, Vyvodsky's motives, uh, the, the enforcing Vyvodsky's transfers. So uh, in this sense, so in this sense, um, sphere, so our, our, our examples, um, sorry, uh, have universality properties. So this is like each, each of these isomorphisms says the universality with respect to this kind of covariance, right? And um, uh, I forgot to say this. So we know this only after inverting uh, P if we are in characteristic P, and, but uh, these two actually work over any base. And uh, maybe the, the last third to observe. So this, these categories of correspondences are of course not unrelated. So there is forgetful maps from frame to finite symptomic. You just forget the extra trivialization. And you, here you just forget the LCI condition. And also there is a natural map here, which uh, takes a span. So if, if this were like F and G, so you send it to the cycle associated to the push forward. Sorry, you, I mean, you project to X times Y and they then take the associated cycle. So like taking fundamental class. So there are very natural, uh, this like natural maps between these cohomology theories induce also very natural maps are, are like related to very natural maps between these categories of correspondences. So the, the covariances are well related and um, I'm out of time. I'd just like to say the last sentence that although what I've been talking for 45 minutes looks kind of abstract maybe, so these are just structural properties, but um, the structure of transfers has, is usually very useful for computations uh, in a cohomology theory. And um, so for example, in, in Suslin's rigidity theorem, which I had to read yesterday, the structure of transfers in K-theory uh, is used. So um, we hope that these structural results are not pro only providing theoretical descriptions, but hopefully will be also used in practice. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for a very elegant talk. As I understand it, Dan, we go to uh, the breakout rooms now? That's right. We're not going to have a formal uh, question period. We'll save that for the breakout rooms. If you'd like to speak with Maria, you can do that. Ask her follow-up questions. You can do that in the, um, in the breakout rooms, okay? So um, what is going to happen now is that I am going to assign people essentially randomly to breakout rooms. 
And then when you enter the breakout rooms, you should be able, in the breakout room menu, you should be able to see the different breakout rooms, who's in which room, and you should be able to move yourself between rooms. That's the way it's supposed to work. Um, hopefully it does do that, um, in, in fact. One extra warning, if you are using a uh, mobile device or a tablet, you may not be able to move yourself between rooms. So it's best to be using um, like a laptop or computer for this particular feature. I should have warned you about that in advance. And of course, if you need to leave, you're welcome to do so. No one's required to stick around. Okay, so um, I'm gonna set these up now and this should take effect in just a few seconds. Oh, let me stop, stop screen sharing.